Thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you today. Um, the, I, I, have a, I have a wonderful um, a career that involves a joint appointment in two different units at the University of Arizona. Um, my primary home is in the Arizona State Museum where I'm a curator of zooarchaeology. And then my, um, my other home is in the School of Anthropology um, with Diane and Steve and Mary. Um, where I am associate director of the School of Anthropology. So um, I'm fortunate to get to wear a lot of hats. I get to do a lot of things in my job on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but we are also very fortunate to have such a close relationship with Archaeology Southwest and also uh, Desert Archaeology, which I'll talk quite a bit about today. Um, they have been long supporters of both ASM and the School of Anthropology, and we're just really grateful for that continuing collaborative and supportive relationship. So thank you, Bill, um, especially for this this, uh, these wonderful relationships that we've built up over the last 11 years since I got here. <laughs> so, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my um, research in, in zooarchaeology, the study of animal remains from archaeological sites. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a project that is a collaborative project between um, Desert Archaeology and the University of Arizona and also na the National Park Service on Guavabi. So um, I'll, I'll switch modes a little bit and start talking more about um, field work that we have ongoing right now. But we're going to start with some fun stuff about animal bones. And I promise it will be fun. So I want to tell you uh, just a little bit about my research theme. So what I'm interested in generally as a historical zooarchaeologist, so somebody who's interested in animal bones in the historical period, the last 500 years. Um, I'm really interested in understanding the experiences of Native Americans under colonialism. So as European, Spanish, English, French, and others arrived into the Americas, what was the experiences from the, the Native American side? Um, I'm specifically interested in understanding how the introduction of Eurasian livestock, like pigs, and um, in this area more cattle, um, sheep, uh, chickens impacted Native American daily life. So were these animals adopted? Were they not? Um, how were they integrated into Native American e economic systems? And what was the relationship with um, Native Americans and these um, incoming colonial groups? Um, I'm really interested in how Native American labor uh, became part of early colonial market economies. So um, Native Americans often participated in these economic exchanges, particularly through the, the um, I'll say, the contribution of labor, not the donation of labor, because it was not necessarily um, their idea to begin with, um, but how they were sort of the key drivers in this emergence of this colonial market economy um, that we see in, in North America. Um, I'm also interested in kind of rewriting the narrative of the frontier. And I'll specifically use an example for the mission period, because that's what I'll be talking about here um, today. I also work in the colonial period southeast. Um, uh, missionization was a part of that, but there were some other forces at work in the south that, that I won't talk about today. But um, in, the, in the west, what we see, the narrative of missionization is often um, we think about Kino, this sort of frontier missionary hero going out onto the landscape and um, you know, proselytizing and establishing all these missions. And we tend to think about missions as being these sort of frontier outposts that are kind of isolated from everything, just trying to eke out a landscape on the living. I mean, at least <laughs> eke out a living on the landscape. Um, but what, I, what I'm seeing with the research is, is how all of these different entities, the missions and other colonial entities, were really interrelated and building a regional economy that ultimately led to the formation of a global economy that we see today. So I know that seems like a tall order, but um, bear with me, and you'll get to see the connection between uh, bones in the ground here in the desert southwest and the global economy as we experience it today. Believe me, it's coming. Okay. Um, and that gets me to my last goal, which is to make those linkages, because that's really what gets us jazzed as archaeologists, is to make the linkages between a tiny cut mark on a deer astragalus, which is an ankle bone, in rural Alabama, which is still really the frontier. Um, <laughs> having spent enough time there, <laughs> it's a great place, but um, to a global market economy and bookbinding industries, for example, in Paris and London. We can make those connections through archaeology, and that's, that's why I love what I do. So that's what I'll um, try to do for you guys today. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about colonialism and missionization, because that's the, um, the topic of, of today's uh, talk here in the Pimaria Alta. And a lot of you know a little bit about m the mission period and missionization. Um, most of you know who Father Kino was, Eusebio Francisco Kino. Um, just a quick question, though. Um, was Kino Spanish? Good. He was Italian. I'm a quarter Italian, so I always like to make that point. Um, <laughs> So something to keep in mind is when we talk about Spanish colonialism, in fact, many of the people that came here were not even remotely Spanish. So the missionaries at Guavavi that I'll talk about, um, about 
let's see, 75 to 80 percent of them were not Spanish or not Mexican. They hadn't been born in Spain or Mexico. They were German. They were Swiss. Um, in some cases, they were Irish. Does anybody know who the founder of the, the Tucson Presidio was? Yeah, Hugo O'Connor, uh, Hugo O'Connor. So he wasn't Spanish either, right? <laughs> okay, so just keep in mind that Spanish colonialism, we use that phrase, but um, this, is, uh, uh, this is sort of a shorthand for what was, in fact, a very multicultural um, colonial process. And also keep in mind Spanish colonial history themselves, they were colonized for about a thousand years um, by the Islamic Empire. And so they themselves were a colony. So um, this is, you have to sort of think about Sp Spain um, in its context. And of course, Spain, um, at the time when Kino was coming through, was only about 250 years old. So it was also a new entity. Most people would have identified not by I'm Spanish, but by their region of origin. Okay, so just bear those in mind as we talk about Spanish colonialism. Um, so Kino came through uh, the Pimri Alta, which is the, the term that the Spanish used to describe northern Arizona, and, or sorry, northern Sonora and southern Arizona. Um, in, in, and he came through in the 1680s and 1690s. Um, he established a bunch of missions, um, but he uh, sort of named missions at places where people were already living. And so he would come across villages and name a mission and then move on to the next place. Most of these places for a very long time were missions in name only. Um, and even after sort of colonialism got going, even after um, Kino was gone and other priests replaced them, many of these missions remained visitas, which means that they didn't actually have a resident priest. There was a priest living somewhere else who would come and do mass maybe every couple of weeks. So m missions, we can think about, um, you know, San Javier de Abac, that's sort of our classic idea of what a mission is. But many of these places wouldn't have really looked like that and wouldn't have behaved in that same way. So, so keep that in mind. There's a lot of variation in what constitutes a mission in terms of just naming these places on the landscape. Okay. Um, Cabecera are head missions. So these were missions that had a resident priest. And that resident priest would then go out to the visitas, the surrounding visitas, and um, proselytize and do mass and baptize and do weddings um, periodically. But the cabecera is where the, the priests were actually living. So, okay, um, missions were also not alone. Um, at first, yes, when Kino came through, he was usually the first to, a European to enter into any of those areas and establish missions. Um, but very quickly after uh, Kino. Um, came through this region, there were other entities, other colonial entities that, that joined the missions, um, including private ranchos. That was one of the first, the earliest entrees were these private ranches um, that, that came up um, from the south. Mining communities, which we'll, get, we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, presidios, forts, um, we all know uh, the one here in, in Tucson, and there were a few others in the area as well. And then there were also secular communities that, that um, came along a little bit later. But all of these entities had demands. Um, missions were usually the first to come. They were the first herds, cattle herds that were introduced with, were at missions. Um, so all of these later entities needed to sort of get started. And the missions were already there, so they were in a position to provide some of the resources that they needed, like food, domesticated animals, um, crops, so seeds, seed crops, uh, cloth, raw materials. And so this is, this is where we're going to uh, get into where the, where the animal bones come into play. Okay, so I want you to um, understand missions. Of course, the religious component was, was very important. That was sort of their uh, stated reason <laughs> for it being. But the real reason um, was economic. It was to claim territory and to identify resources that could be extracted to enrich the crown. So missions were at their very core um, economic enterprises, and they were driven by Native American labor. So missions, um, especially in this part of the world, there wasn't a lot of natural resources that they could draw on. What they could draw on was the, the labor of Native Americans. Okay. So I'm going to talk about three missions today. I'm going to start by talking about Mission San Agustin de Tucson and Mission Nuestra Señora del Pilar de Santiago de Cocospera. And I'll just call them San Agustin and Cocospera <laughs> when I go through them. Um, San Agustin de Tucson was actually excavated by desert archaeology. And they contacted me, I want to say it was about seven years ago, to do the faunal analysis, the zoarchaeological animal bone analysis for San Agustin, uh, knowing that I had a research in the historical period. Um, Homer Teal um, recommended that they, they call on me to do this analysis. And it was really um, a great chance. This was my first entree into southwestern historical zoarchaeology. So it was just really exciting for me to get involved in that project. And, 
thank you, Bill, for bringing me on as a consultant. And then um, Cocospora was excavated by my colleague, Jupiter Martinez, who was with the um, National Institute of Anthropology and History in Mexico. And so he also knew my interest, and so we worked together on, on Cocospora as well, and we did the faunal analysis for that project. So I'll talk about the zooarchaeology um, of those two projects, and then we will talk about Mission Los Santos Angeles de Guavavi, which is a project that's in progress. So I'll just give you some, this is the first time that we've talked about Guavavi in, in public. Um, so this is our first glimpse of, of what we're seeing at Guavavi. So my research questions for the work at San Agustin and Cocospora um, were, whoops, um, was how was ranching practiced at, at the missions? We were pretty sure that um, missions, we see through historical records that uh, livestock were introduced, and then after a time, and that varied how long that took, uh, ranching sort of took hold at, at many of these missions. But what did ranching look like? There's many ways of, of ranching. Um, how did it compare to the kinds of strategies we see New Americans practicing before the introduction of livestock? And then how do we compare that to later ranching strategies as well? We also wanted to know what the role of Otam labor was uh, at these mission communities. Um, what were they, what was the, what were people doing at the missions and how was their labor contributing to the mission economy? Um, and then we also wanted to know, so there is, was this perception of missions as being sort of isolated, but um, we sort of were suspecting that they were sort of making a contribution to this regional economy. So was, what was that? Did they make a contribution to the regional economy? How did they intersect with all of these other entities? So um, we answered the questions for Cocos and San Agustin using zooarchaeology, which is my um, area of interest, and also Mary Steiner's. We have, we have two zooarchaeologists, believe it or not, in the room today. <laughs> And there's only about, I think, 900 of us in the world. So that's, um, that, that's pretty good. Somebody can do the math and tell me how many, what percent we have. So zooarchaeology is, um, as, as we said and Bill said, is a study of animal remains from archaeological sites. Um, we are interested in a number of different topics. Broadly, we just say human environment interactions through animals. Um, so things like diet, domestication, hunting strategies, butchering strategies, um, ritual use of animals too, we'll talk about. Um, uh, so we, the, we, there's a huge umbrella that is underneath uh, zooarchaeology. Basically anything involving animals is, is fair game for zooarchaeologists, especially if there's bones that are left behind we can study. Otherwise it gets a little tricky. Um, this is an <laughs> ongoing project we have actually with James Madison's Montpelier. Um, I won't talk about that today, but we've been doing the zooarchaeology for Montpelier for um, over a decade now, and it's a pretty fascinating project, but something else entirely, so that will be for another day. Um, the the zooarchaeology um, that we do takes place in the Stanley J. Olson Laboratory of Zooarchaeology um, in the Arizona State, State Museum. We have a wonderful collection of about 4,500 skeletons. That's our reference library, so that's what we use to identify the archaeological material. So if you ever want to see a whole lot of bones, I encourage you to come for a visit. So it's a really pretty spectacular place. Okay, before we get into some data, um, I'm going to go over some, some quantitative terms. So this is, this is the hard part of the, of the lecture. Um, but these sound uh, complex, but in fact they're pretty simple. So just uh, follow with me. Um, NASP is one way that we count our data. Um, and it's sort of a real rough count, because basically we're just counting the number of fragments. It stands for the number of identified specimens. It's basically just a, rough, a raw count of how many fragments we have and what animal they're identified to. Um, I'm also going to use MNI, which is an estimate of the minimum number of individuals. So we may have a bunch of fragments, but how many individual animals does, might that represent? And this is an estimate, and it's an estimate of the minimum, so it's also pretty rough. Um, biomass is another estimate based on bone weight, and that's um, to trying to estimate how much meat might have been contributed uh, by a certain a, a given quantity of bone. So these are the three indices I'm going to use. So we've got meat weight, we've got number of individuals, and we've got just number of fragments. All of them have their problems and all of them tell you slightly different things, but when we use them together, sometimes that gives us a, a pretty good picture um, of the past. Okay, so these are our two data graphs for uh, San Agustin and Cocospora, just to give you an idea of the, the sort of broad outlines of the assemblage, what kinds of animals we're getting. What you can see, um, the blue bars are cattle. Um, and by far and away, cattle is, when you look at this assemblage, that's what you're seeing. Uh, you know, almost all the fragments we have are, are cattle. Um, even the stuff that we can't identify except for its large mammal is probably cattle. So it's cattle, 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 lots of, lots of um, cows. Um, and steers. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> I have to be careful not to say cows. The, this bar, though, here um, represents wild game. And the reason why it looks so large in terms of the number of individuals is remember, so cattle, this is one species. Wild game is, is pretty much everything else. And so there's a lot of different species that are represented in that bar. And so because each, you know, you can have one fragment from um, one species and that represents one individual. You can have two fragments that, that are from two different species and that's two individuals. So it doesn't take long before you can add up a pretty high number. Okay. So wild, the, the, it's still interesting though that there's a lot of wild game there because we know that the priests were really reluctant to let people, um, as they called it, to go out onto the landscape and wander around and hunt animals. They wanted to stay, they wanted them to stay um, at the mission, settled permanently, raising domesticated animals. So the fact that the wild game were there these are in context that probably ref represents um, the consumption activities of the mission personnel. So the priests were consuming this. So um, venison, um, we see squirrel, we see, um, of course, lots of rabbits and hares. These were being consumed. So the priests might have been complaining about this wandering, that native people were wandering in the desert and hunting um, to the sur superiors, but that didn't stop them from <laughs> actually eating the venison. Um, what probably was otherwise a very monotonous diet of dried beef. Lots and lots of dried beef. Okay, so that's sort of the overall um, picture. A lot of people are surprised to see pig at Mission Cocospra. This is a slightly higher elevation, a little bit cooler, and there's a little bit more water available, permanent water sources available. So um, that's sort of interesting to see pig. We don't ever see a lot of it, but it's, it's neat to see here in the desert. Usually they don't like the desert so much. There's, they get sunburned. <laughs> a little too bald for the desert. We, um, we can tell by, uh, we can look at zooarchaeological remains, animal bone remains, and say something about age at death. So there's um, some growth patterns in uh, animal skeletons, and mammal skeletons, that we can use to estimate um, how old the animal was when it died. Um, so we've looked at the assemblage of cattle remains um, from San Agustin and Cocospra, and most of them are between the ages of 24 months, so two years, and 48 months, four years. And that's sort of a pretty typical um, slaughtering strategy where you're killing animals as, as, as they reach uh, full body size, but not long after. So if you, you raise an animal to full body size and you let it keep living, you're kind of just putting a lot of resources into it, but you're not going to get any additional meat out of it. So this is kind of a, a sort of typical efficient strategy for, for killing um, animals, for, for managing herds. Um, we also uh, hypothesize based on the um, based on the historical records, that these animals, there probably wasn't a lot of fresh beef available and that the, there was a fall slaughter and perhaps then a secondary spring slaughter. Um, we have some documents, including this rather grim um, quote from one of the priests at San Ignacio um, about what, what happened in the fall when they, <laughs> when they slaughtered and there was lots of fresh beef av available. So I'll read it for you just in case it's a little uh, blurry in the back. Um, on November 11th, and this is 1758, Catalina, wife of Cristobal, um, the coolie, he uh, burst from an intestinal blockage caused by eating too much meat during the slaughter. She, she did not receive the sacraments and was buried here in the cemetery without cross and without light and without ringing the bells. Gaspar Steger. So this is a record in the, the mission, the church record of her death. So he's recording her death, when the day that it happened, what she died of, and what happened around her death. So. Um, Anybody know why she might have been denied the sacraments of death? Gluttony, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm a little bit suspicious about this because then, I think it was two months later, or was it two months earlier? Dale will know. There was a woman who died um, and was denied the sacraments of death because she overdid it on squash. Oh. <laughs> so I'm sort of wondering if there was, wasn't dysentery going around. <laughs> had nothing to do with gluttony. I don't know how you can gorge yourself on squash and die, but um, that's what happened. And um, I, I meant to change this because somebody told me I probably shouldn't show this at <laughs> in polite society, but um, it works. Sorry, you're, you're eating. I'll move on to the next slide. Um, so as we were um, going through these assemblages, uh, I, you know, I've worked on the East Coast for a while, and I came from a, a collection that was in great shape. We had lots of whole elements. It was very easy work. Um, very enjoyable, very diverse assemblage. And then I come and I'm working on St. Augustine for the first time and <laughs> it's just a pile of broken up cow bones and they're all like this big. And it was just like, I'm going through this stuff, it's just it's sort of mind numbing. It's probably the least fun I've had as a zooarchaeologist. Um, but um, there's, there was something in there. Um, and you know, so okay, so this is all 
fragmented. Okay, so let's get into this and let's let's say let's try to quantify this and really sort of well try to quantify my angst about working on this assemblage. So you can't just say it's really broken up. You've got to demonstrate that. So um, one of the ways of doing that, um, this is kind of rough, is to take the number of elements. So we want to say, um, look at the assemblage and try to figure out how many uh, humerus, this is your humerus here, how many femurs, how many tibias, um, how many radius and ulna. Um, and you want to count up the number of elements that are represented, similar to M and I, but instead of the whole animal, we're just looking at individual whole elements. And then you want to divide that by the number of um, fragments. Oh, sorry. You want to, yeah, divide number of elements by the, the number of fragments. And this is going to give you a fragmentation index. So um, this is what we got for St. Augustine and Cocospora. So the important thing to compare these numbers to, 0.32 and 0.11, is if all the elements were whole, so if it was just a bunch of whole bones, um, this would be one. And these are actually very, very, very low, um, which was great, because I felt better about my angst, <laughs> but also meant that there was probably something going on. And um, at the same time that we were doing this research on St. Augustine, a couple of Mary Steiner students were actually in the lab. And I swear I'm not telling this story just because you're here. So she had a couple of PhD students who were working on um, upper Paleolithic assemblages or middle Paleolithic assemblages from Europe. And so these were um, Neanderthal and perhaps a little bit later into early, mo in early humans, early modern humans in Europe. And their assemblages look just like mine. <laughs> and I remember, like, we had this sort of conversation, this sort of epiphany. You know, their stuff, it was different animals, totally different time period, but it looked the same. And so we started talking, so what is this? What are they seeing? Well, for them, it was grease rendering. So Neanderthals were um, uh, breaking up bone, boiling it, um, extracting the grease, and that was consumed um, as a food resource. And so I started thinking to myself, OK, hmm, that might mean something. OK, so then we had to do a little bit more data analysis. And I'll, I'll come back to that, that concept in just a second. So a, another way that we can sort of quantify or visualize the data, um, this fragmentation, is to uh, actually depict or to, to measure all these fragments and then graph them out on a graph. So what we saw is that 90% um, of the assemblage of the cattle, this is medium and large mammals. So this would also include sheep. These fragments were less than 5 centimeters in maximum dimension. 80% of these fragments are less than 4 centimeters in maximum dimension. So this is cow bone and a few sheep in there broken down to fragments about this size. So to see this sort of graphed out was like, OK, we're really on to something. Um, another way that you can look at fragmentation, because um, it's not enough to just say that it's broken. You have to know when it was broken. Was it broken in the ground, or was it broken intentionally by humans? And this is a little bit tougher to do, because the sample size that you can actually look at these kinds of patterns on is, is much smaller than the overall assemblage. But what we're seeing, based on the elements that we could apply this technique called the Fracture Freshness Index, most of them were broken when the bone was fresh. This means that it was broken at the time of death. This is an intentional breakage. This isn't something that the bones broke in the ground after the fact. So this is intentional fragmentation. You can see here, um, there's a few things we look at to know whether it's a green break. The, the sort of best way to describe it to you is if you break um, a china teacup, that would be like a green break. If you break um, a uh, flower pot, that's more like what a, a dry break would look like. So fresh bone, when it breaks, it looks like porcelain. And dry bone, when it breaks, it looks like pottery. Okay. So that's basically what we're looking at. So this one here, this is a nice classic fresh break here, or, um, broken when the bone was fresh. This light color here, I'm sorry, it's not going to come out very well in the back, um, is a break that happened later. So we can also see that it's lighter in color. That means that it broke probably in the lab, um, not actually in the ground. And it's very rough, like pottery, very rough textured, as opposed to this nice, smooth, clean break. So what we're seeing is that there are a lot of fresh breaks, and that would indicate that this, this fracturing took place um, around the time um, of death. So what does that mean? <laughs> Put this all together. Why were they breaking up all these bones? And why was my assemblage so similar to Britt and Tina's assemblage um, thousands of miles away and tens of thousands of years? Um, well, it's not grease. That's not what we call it in the historic period. It's tallow. Um, what they were doing is actually rendering these animals for tallow. They were extracting tallow, which is the same thing, bone grease. Um, from, from bones. Um, and so that, this is why we work with students, because if those two weren't, weren't there, it would have, I probably would have come to the same conclusion eventually, but it would have taken me a heck of a lot longer. So they were, you know, we were all looking at, looking from one table to the next, and one table to the next, and 
Aha, tallow, of course, tallow was a really important resource in the 18th century. Um, so tallow, we, and then I began to explore this a little bit more, and there's actually a historical record um, from 1795. He actually did the observations in the 1750s and didn't publish until 1795, but Ignace uh, Pfefferkorn wrote down his observations of some of the Otham in northern Sonora um, rendering tallow. And so as I dug a little bit deeper, we actually found historical documentation to, s to show that they were doing this and how they did it, which is um, even more important from a methodological standpoint. So basically what Pfefferkorn found is that, that, here's the quote, those who slaughter several cattle at one time, throw all the bones and marrow into a kettle full of water, cook them, and skim off the, flat, the fat floating on top. He said that they would also consume some of that. So he said the really good stuff was like a butter, and they would use that, I guess, on toast. I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but then there was an, you know, industrial uses for tallow as well. So in the 18th century, the primary use for tallow was for candles, for tallow candles. Um, beeswax were extremely expensive, and tallow candles alone were, were quite pricey um, in this area. So um, being able to make your own was, was pretty important for the missions. We also know that um, in the 18th century, bef this is pre-fossil um, pre fuel <laughs> era, uh, the tallow would have been, been used as an industrial lubricant. So anything you would have needed grease for, tallow could have been used. And then also soap would have been used for the manufacture of soap. So these are all really, really important and necessary um, needs in the 18th century. And this is a demonstration tallow vet in, uh, in California. Um, and in California, we've known for a long, long time that the missions were rendering tallow and also hides um, for trade. And those, the, those resources were often shipped off um, down to Mexico. Um, but we didn't know this about Arizona. We didn't know that this, this, was, this kind of activity was happening um, here in Arizona. So um, one of the big questions was, well, certainly um, missions, churches, would have some need for tallow candles. Um, they would have some need for some of these other uses. Um, but when you start thinking about the region and what else is going on, some of the things that I've mentioned already, so we've got Mission San Agustin and Mission Cucuspra, and just down to the south are um, a whole bunch of mining communities. And what do mines need? <laughs> candles, <laughs> um, cart axle grease. Um, they also need soap, mining is apparently a pretty messy job. I've not done it myself, but I've heard. Um, and we also know that there was a great demand for cattle hide. Um, unfortunately, because m these assemblages are so broken up, we, we don't see the cut marks for skinning of animals. We presume that they were, but they're just obliterated by all this fragmentation. OK. Oh, let me go back a little bit. Um, there's a few more things I wanted to say. So I also looked at some of the ethnographic information. And so the, uh, there's also some zooarchaeologists that have done some experiments. And they, um, what we see around the world and also in this experiment was that the ideal size for breaking bone to boil and extract the maximum ma amount of grease is about four to five centimeters, so <laughs> which is exactly what we're finding at Cocospora and um, San Agustin. So that was, that was pretty gratifying. So what we're seeing is this contribution of the missions to this regional trade. Um, they're, of course, using these uh, tallow candles locally, but I think that a lot of the stuff is destined for this regional market. In the 17th century in New Mexico, they actually lifted um, the usual ban on intercolony trade so that the mines or the missions could provide tallow candles specifically to the mining communities in New Mexico. And so we also have this historical record that shows that even Spanish colonial policy about intercolony trade was lifted so that the missions could provide the needed um, raw materials or candles um, for the mines. So this was great to see the zooarchaeology here in um, Arizona um, showing what we know for other re regions, um, but we, we did not know for, for uh, southern Arizona and northern Sonora. Okay, so um, one of the other questions that we had um, about the practice of ranching um, at these missions were how these animals were managed on the landscape. These are alien creatures. Um, they're not native to Arizona. Um, cattle are graze a little bit differently than our native ungulates. These are grazers, not browsers. So we wanted to kind of see how these animals might have been managed in this landscape um, where they hadn't lived before. Um, one of the, the big questions that we didn't know, we kind of had a suspicion, but we didn't know how, to what extent these animals were free-ranged or were they kept close to home, were they foddered, were they um, grazed on spent fields, um, how were they sort of managed, how was their, their food managed. 
And one of the big questions was, can we tell? And I'll get to why, why that was a question in just a second. The other post hoc question, so we didn't know we were interested in this until the data told us we were interested in this. Um, so we call that a post hoc <laughs> question, was how was water managed for livestock use? Okay, so this was a surprise. We didn't know we were going to get this. So, but you, you know, sometimes you revise your research questions based on what you see. Okay, so um, I was working with um, now Dr. Gianna Grimstead, who actually just started her um, first academic position at The Ohio State University. Um, this is Deanna right here, and she is a stable isotope specialist, and so um, I worked with her on this project to see if we could use chemical signatures, isotopic signatures, inside cattle and um, sheep teeth to tell us things about how the animals were fed and, and what they consumed. So the food and water that we eat, and that includes us, um, is leaves little signatures, isotopic chemical signatures in our teeth and bones. And you can um, assay those, you can measure those, and um, tell th things about what kinds of foods you were eating broadly. Um, not, you know, necessarily cheese on your hamburger level <laughs> of analysis, but you know, whether you're eating um, lots of corn or lots of other kinds of plant material. Um, so this is the, the, the crux of the issue here is that maize, which is corn, um, is, we call it a C4 plant. It has a different chemical signature from most other temperate plants, which follow a C3 pathway. So um, just you know, maize are C4. Most everything else, um, with a few notable exceptions, um, are C3. Um, so maize-based diets in some parts of North America can be very distinctive. They can look very, very different from diets that are based on other plant materials. Um, however, <laughs> here in the desert, most of our grasses um, have the same pathway as corn. They're C4. So we weren't even sure if this was going to be possible. The other problem is that cactus are kind of middle ground in between C3 and C4. They're called CAM. And so they yield a signature that's sort of in between. And so we know from modern cattle that they're eating significant amounts of cactus. And so this could be kind of muddying the signal. So there are some real problems with trying to do this technique. But nobody had ever tried it before, so we had to. Okay, so what we did was we, um, we had the archaeological data, but we wanted to also um, come up with a modern example and sort of get a, sort of a full sequence of so cow to what they're drinking and what they're eating. And so we managed to get some cow uh, remains <laughs> from the meat sciences department on campus, and then they led us to what ranch those had come from, and we went down to the McGibbon uh, King Ranch, and we sampled the water that they're drinking, that these animals are drinking, and then we also sampled some of the pasturage that they're grazed on. So we could sort of complete the cycle with modern cow cattle to see um, how these, these isotope signatures are, are laid down. Um, what we found, uh, not surprisingly, is that there is a mixed diet, but it is predominantly C4. So at um, St. Augustine especially, this is a predominantly C4, which could be maize, could be desert grass, um, uh, um, grass uh, uh, forage as well. Um, Cocos Row was actually less C4 dominant, which is interesting. Um, what we also discovered by working with some of my colleagues over in Natural Resources is that, yes, most of the grasses that these guys were grazing, the modern animals, were C4. So um, that's, that's probably um, a problem going forward in terms of distinguishing maize foddering from, um, from native grasses and, and free ranging. And, and we know from working with modern ranchers that they are eating a lot of cactus, and so that probably is muddying the signal quite a bit. And I won't go too much into those graphs. It's a lot of data. Um, we also looked at um, oxygen isotopes. So um, we were, this we thought was going to tell us a little bit more about the food, but what it ended up telling us about was actually the water. So when we sampled um, the uh, modern water, what we found is that this was water that had been kind of sitting around for a while, and it was showing a signature that was somewhat evaporated. But when we compared it to the cattle teeth, the, the water signature in the cattle teeth, um, the archaeological cattle teeth were even more sort of intensely evaporated. So what we're seeing is that the water that they're drinking is evaporated. It's concentrated. It means that it had been sitting out there on the landscape for a long period of time. So this is still water. This isn't running water. So they're probably not bringing the cattle down to the river to drink because that's moving water that's going to have not a highly evaporated signature. What they're doing is storing water on the landscape for cattle use. And those of you that know ranching practices today, this is not a surprise because that's what uh, modern ranchers do. Um, what's really interesting to me is that we know that the Hoakam 
were managing water, they were storing water. We have these tanks that date to the, the Hoacom period. We know that um, ranchers, Anglo ranchers and Mexican ranchers in the 19th century were storing water, but this sort of bridges that sort of technology knowledge gap from the Hoacom to the modern period. So the missions were also storing water for livestock use. They were also managing water on the landscape, also building some of these storage structures for cattle. But the other thing is it kind of tells me is that and they're also aware of and trying to manage the impact of cattle on riparian or, or riverine environments. So they're trying to keep them away from those riparian zones. Um, we know from historical documents that Native people complained a lot about these animals getting down into the river and pooping and peeing and um, tearing up the riverbed. And so they complained vociferously about this, so get these animals out of here. Um, so we, this is showing us that the missions may have been responding to that environmental concern by storing water elsewhere to keep them away from that riparian zone. So that's really pretty exciting um, stuff to be able to see just in chemical signatures and livestock teeth that are a couple hundred years old. Okay, oh, and I forgot to say, there's also some, um, some indication that there was greater access to fresh water at Cocospra, which is not surprising. If you go there today, there's still a perennial um, stream, and there's actually two streams that come together. Um, so there would have been more access to fresh water at Cocospra than at San, San Agustin, also a smaller population, so perhaps less concern about environmental effects of all of these animals. Okay, so some conclusions from uh, the zooarchaeology of, of Cocospra and, and San Agustin. Obviously, cattle ranching was, was paramount, definitely was the dominant um, activity at these, at, these, uh, at these missions. And ranching was definitely about commodity extraction. This wasn't just about feeding the mission um, population. This was about extracting a com commodity that could be sold on a regional marketplace. And they were after tallow, just like in, in California. Um, and again, the missions engaged with this regional economy. They, they weren't just frontier outposts isolated from everything. They were fully engaged in a regional market economy through the production of tallow. And all of that, of course, was driven by Otham labor. There weren't lots of Spaniards living at these missions. These were Otham that were contributing the labor to render these, these animals. So our conclusion from the isotopes is that probably free-ranging and maize foddering is not going to be distinguishable <laughs> in, in the archaeological record, unfortunately, at least not in the Sonoran Desert. It works great in upstate New York, where I'm from, not so much in the Sonoran Desert. Um, but what we saw from the archaeological record is, is something that does reflect a, a more of a free-range strategy. If they were able to eat cactus, they're, they're out there in the landscape. And um, we know from historical documents, too, that this was more likely. They were rounded up periodically for branding and slaughter, but for the most part, they're out there um, on the landscape. The big surprise, though, was that missions were storing water for livestock use. That was something we, we didn't um, know, except for a few little references here and there. So to see that directly from the archaeological record was, was pretty cool. Okay, so um, we're going to switch a little bit and talk about some of the rec recent research that um, I've been working on, and this is uh, in a collaboration with um, Desert Archaeology and also National Park Service. And this is uh, Mission Guavave, and I will tie, I promise, all of this stuff together in the end. Um, it's going to seem a little bit like I'm switching totally different topics, but I'm not, and it will, it will come together at the end. Okay. So I wanted to first um, acknowledge the project co-directors, because this is not just my project. This is, um, I have two project co-directors, um, including Homer Teal. Have any of, some, some of you definitely know him, and <laughs> many of you probably have met him, um, who is a project director at Desert Archaeology. And, and I've known Homer for a long time, and when this opportunity came up, um, he was, of course, the first person I thought to, and I did not want to do this project uh, without Homer. And I don't think I want to do field work again, actually, without Homer. He is fantastic. <laughs> and our other collaborator is Jeremy Moss um, at the National Park Service, and he is at Tumacacri National Historic Park. And he actually approached us to um, see if we were interested in doing um, an archaeological field school on some endangered contexts at the National Park down there. And this was a heck of an opportunity. The National Park is not about allowing lots of subsurface excavation. They're about preservation. And so to have this opportunity because of some of these contexts being destroyed um, was really remarkable and um, just a, a great opportunity for all of us. Um, Jeremy, um, unfortunately, is leaving to McCockery. Um, yeah, in I think next week, assuming the government doesn't shut down. Um, he's staying within the National Park System, um, but he's leaving to McCockery for, no, I'm blanking. Pecos, thank you. Yeah, I had it this morning and then it left. Pecos, for Pecos. So we are very sad about this, but very happy for him. So we'll be working with whoever um, they replace um, Jeremy with <laughs> next spring, hopefully. Okay, so just a little bit about Guavavi. Um, have, have anybody been down to Guavavi and seen the ruins? 
recently, yeah, yeah. So you have a sense of the place. And um, this is what the walls look like today. You can compare it to the slide that, that, um, that Bill showed. Um, I was going to say, the, you can see it's on a mound. So this is all the adobe melt that's sort of come off the walls. So the walls extend down through that mound quite a bit, just to sort of um, help you see how tall it <laughs> would be. Um, they get a lot of questions at Guavavi about the preservation of the walls. And what they do is they just put adobe mud on top of the wall, sort of a little cap, to try to slow down the process of decay. But they're taking a very different strategy at Guavavi than they did at Tumacacari um, or at Calabasas, where there's a big shelter. Um, and it's, it's the way that they've handled it is really preserve the sense of place. So you go there and you really have a sense of this is you know where people were living doesn't there's not the sort of distraction of a large metal shed <laughs> over the building it really they have preserved that sense of place um, um, more in a different way than they have at some of the other sites okay so it was initially founded by Kino uh, within an existing Otham community that we haven't yet identified haven't yet found um, in 1691 um, the first church was built by Grasshopper in 1732 um, we're not sure where exactly that church is but Maybe we'll find it someday. And then in 1751, they began the construction on this church, but the Pima Revolt sort of interrupted some of that construction. Um, the interesting thing about Guavavi is that it was only ever a Jesuit um, occupation. It was only ever a Jesuit mission. It was never, the Franciscans never replaced the Jesuits at um, Guavavi, unlike elsewhere, where you'll see sort of a Franciscan overlay on top of a um, Jesuit church. That didn't happen here. So it gives us also an opportunity to see what sort of a pure, I'm, I'm using that term intentionally funny, um, a Jesuit <laughs> mission would have looked like without the sort of Franciscans coming in later and adding their signature to this, these missions. Um, it was also only occupied, uh, only sort of an active use for about 75 years. So it's also a pretty nice um, tight time component as well. Um, so in 1770, or by 1775, the mission was, was abandoned. Everybody who was living there had moved to Tumacacari, and it, nobody was living there anymore. Um, we, uh, s the Park Service had known that the Aki's miners had moved in a little bit later. We didn't know where, but roughly in the area. So um, I'm putting this up as a little premature conclusion that we, we're pretty sure we have identified a Yaki component at the mission from the early 1800s, and I'll talk a little bit about that in just a sec. OK, so our big research questions going into our first field season at Guavavi that we just finished up in the spring um, were, first, is there a prehistoric component at Guavavi? There were some uh, features that Homer was pretty sure were Hoakam era, so we wanted to see if, if uh, he was right. Um, there's a, an a unknown adobe structure, and we kind of were suspecting that maybe it was an early church that had been built there. So we wanted to explore that and see if we could figure out the function of that adobe. And then also we were able, we had the opportunity to work in the, in the midden, um, which is the trash heap. And so that was going to give us an opportunity to talk about uh, the role of Guavavi in a regional or perhaps even a global economy, because that's where the, the stuff, you know, the trash ends up. So I'll show you, this is a map from a report that Desert Archaeology um, published a few years ago that Homer wrote with some of his colleagues. And so just to sort of orient you on the site, um, these, let's see, these are the standing walls right here of the, um, of the mission. So this is the mission compound, the central compound, if you've been up there. Um, and we had a chance to work in the mission midden. There were some rodents digging big holes in the midden, so that gave us a chance to put some units in that disturbed area um, and to mitigate some of that um, some of that destruction. We also, this is the, the unknown adobe structure, um, and it's a mound at this point. Um, but there's a road that has truncated um, one corner of it, the northwest corner of it, has been basically run over. And so that gave us a chance to at least look in that area to see if we could figure out the, 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 um, where the walls are and perhaps get at the, the, the function of, of that structure. And then this road is actually still active. So <laughs> there's ranchers and uh, border patrol agents running right over a whole bunch of features, including some pit houses and some roasting pits. This is one of the roasting pits here before we, we excavated it. So we also had this great chance. Um, this is actually on city property, city of no Nogales, not Park Service property. Um, to look at some of these features since they are being actively run over. <laughs> it was a, a good chance to get in there and, and take a look. Um, so in uh, uh, spring 2013, we um, had ran an archaeological field school through the University of Arizona. So we had nine, um, which is, is pretty good because the field school happened sort of at the last minute. 
um, and we had nine people sign up right away to um, do this field school. So we had nine uh, undergraduates from the University of Arizona. Um, the Tohono O'odham Nation um, paid for three site monitors uh, to come and work with us. So we had a really great crew, and it was very sort of collaborative and just a really great field season. Um, set a high bar for our next field season for sure. Okay, so I want to show you just, we're in the process of analyzing the artifacts and writing reports, and so uh, we're not quite ready to show you lots of, of graphs with data on them, but I want to show you a little bit about what we found and what, what we saw um, in the ground. Um, there were a few, you can see the road here, so this is the active ranch road, and we actually had um, a couple of times almost got run over by border patrol agents, and one time there was an ambulance that came screaming by, and we still don't know what... <laughs> what they were after, but it was very, very stressful. We had barriers set up in the road, but um, boy, you never know. So this was one of the uh, roasting pits that we found. It was beautiful once they excavated it. And the, um, one of the ranchers from Santa Fe Ranch came and saw it, and he said, I can't believe I've been driving over this thing for decades, you know. And there it was. So um, with these are uh, Ho'okam era, but we're still waiting to figure out what the, the dates are um, on these. The great thing is that um, Homer has x-ray vision, so he can just walk around. <laughs> And he sees everything. I mean, it's just, I, I mean, it's incredible. It's like he's just, he can see everything. And so he, as he was wandering around, said, there's a whole village here. And he was pointing out all of these pit houses everywhere. And of course, you don't see it. And then he starts pointing it out to you. And you're like, yeah, it's, it's totally there. So we're hoping this field season we'll get to look at the extent of this, this village that he is uh, convinced, and so am I, is there. So, um, so this is one of the, this is two of the different pit houses that, um, we found in the road, and then he found a whole bunch more off the road. Um, a lot of these um, pit houses were often grouped, so the doorways would face in towards the central courtyard. And so if you see one, you can sort of extrapolate maybe where there are others. So it'd be great if we can go back and, and take a look at where some of these other pit houses might be. Um, and the <laughs> Um, since I'm still relatively new to fieldwork in, in the Southwest, especially prehistoric uh, fieldwork, I had not fully understood the importance of spray paint and uh, leaf blowers. So this was um, very illuminating for me. In one of the pit houses, we found this, um, this carved object. It's carved stone. And we're getting conflicting ideas as to what it is. We've, um, some people said it was a fire starting kit. Um, but others have said that it's a makeup kit, kit or a pigment kit for applying pigment. So um, we're not sure. If you have ideas, let me know. We'll see what we, what we get. The historic context that we worked on uh, was the, the primary um, structural context that we looked at was this uh, an unknown adobe mound structure. And so you can see the road coming through here and truncating um, the northwest corner of the structure. Um, we scraped back the road, and lo and behold, um, we could see bricks. <laughs> so I don't know if you can make it out, but do you see little stripes, like zebra striping right here? Those are rows of adobe bricks with um, mortar in between. And it was just clear as day. It was unbelievable. So basically what happened, the, the back wall of the structure just went boom, ex you know, exploded down into the road and then got run over. But the bricks are still there. We counted, I think it was 16 rows of bricks before they petered out um, into the road track. So um, that, was, that was pretty amazing. That was quite a moment. Um, so we, we didn't do very much inside um, the structure. So we found where the wall had collapsed on the outside. And then we decided to go inside, because um, we knew that there wouldn't be wall stuff on the inside. And what they found was this is a, a burned beam, so a pretty large beam. Um, we found also the, the little beam. So I'm going to forget my terms, but the vigas and the, what are the big ones? Latias and the Vegas. So we found both of those, um, which was pretty spectacular. But there was nothing inside the structure. <laughs> very little actually came out of it. And the floor was pretty clean. There was a layer of very fine dust on the floor. So what we think happened is that it was abandoned. It was open for a while. Dust blew in. And eventually it caught fire and burned down. And then the walls collapsed. Um, but we don't know yet what the structure is. So we're hoping to be able to go back and, and do a little bit more investigation. We, we're hoping this would be the, one of the early churches. But um, there's some interior walls to this, so several interior walls, which doesn't make sense for a church. On the other hand, walls can always be added later. So um, stay tuned. Hopefully we'll have a better idea next season of, of what this thing was. Um, in the midden, which is where I spent most of my time, because that's where all the animal bone was coming out, tons and tons of animal bone, thousands. I think we have something like 10,000 fragments that came out of the animal bone, just from one field season, two two-by-two two units. So this is pretty remarkable. 
Um, the midden was just uh, it was amazing and spectacular in terms of artifacts we found. This is Chinese porcelain, which is actually pretty typical for a, a mission, believe it or not. We always find a little bit of Chinese porcelain at missions. And um, I'll talk about, well, I can ask now. Anybody know how Chinese porcelain would have made it to a mission in southern Arizona in the 18th century? Anybody except for Dale? Oh, no. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Remember that there had been the Spanish galleon coming from the Orient bearing mm -hmm. goodies from China. Absolutely, they yes. They were trading along the west coast of uh, Mexico. Yep, so the Philippines was the a Philippines Spanish colony. They cycled up following the uh, currents up to approximately the area where Seattle is and coming yeah. down the coast and probably down to Acapulco. Exactly, <laughs> precisely. So this stuff would have gone to Acapulco. Before. I probably should have just stayed in Acapulco, but it came all the way up. To <laughs> if it knew any better, it would have stayed there. So yeah, so these Spanish <laughs> galleons would have gone to the Philippines, which had an active, obviously, trade with China, picked up Chinese porcelain, brought it to the coast of Mexico, and then by mule train up to the missions in southern Arizona. <laughs> Who knew? Um, other things that we found, this is Spanish olive jar. So this would have been imported from Spain, would have contained olives or olive oil. Um, glass, this is glass, believe it or not. It came out and I was totally mystified. I thought it was metal. No, it's glass. It's just highly oxidized. Um, glass beads from either um, Czechoslovakia or possibly from Italy. I'm going to go with Italy since I'm a quarter Italian, but that's okay. And then the world's smallest um, point. I know they're smaller than this, but of course this is new for me, so I'm I just was amazed. This is like a wee point. Where did, how did they make this? So this is a, a very small, well, probably typically sized a vibrate point. But those of us that are um, come from other parts of the world, this is an incredibly small little projectile point right here. So, um, so that's what we found in the mid. Uh, tons of, of animal bone. Um, this is there's some deer, um, but mainly we've got sheep. Um, probably some goat mixed in there as well, and then cattle, 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 lots of cattle. And the students are still working on the analysis of the remains. Um, I'm seeing some fresh breakage, but not as much as we saw at San Agustin and Cocospra. So it may be a little different story um, at Guavavi. We'll see. Um, so the, the benefit of working with desert archaeology um, is that they have the most incredible staff and resources. And they think nothing of um, having Mike Brack come down for the day and fly a drone around your site to take pictures. Um, you know, we're all just in awe, but they're like, yeah, we've got a drone. We'll, we'll send a drone up there and take some pictures. <laughs> OK, Homer, that sounds great. Let's do that. So Mike came down and um, sent this drone around. It happened to be the day we had a bunch of fifth graders visiting, so they thought it was the coolest thing ever, too. And um, lo and behold, we saw lots of stuff that we kind of knew was there. But and I'm not sure if you can make this out, too. Some of these, you kind of have to squint. But um, this is the mission, uh, the standing walls of the church right here. And then just off to the northeast, they, we found a grid. And when we walked out there, we, there were, Homer could see it, a bunch of adobe walls lined up um, in the ground. And it was a grid. It was this really enormous, I think we counted eight rooms in one direction, compound structure. Adobe walled, um, we couldn't see much else, but it was this grid right there in this clearing. Um, and nobody had ever seen it before. So sometimes it takes sending a drone up over a site to see the grid. So um, we don't know what that is, and we're hoping that this field season we might be able to figure that out. But it's this enormous adobe walled compound structure right next to the mission that nobody um, even noticed before. <laughs> so, But Homer in his x-ray vision, he walked out there and he's like, yep, there it is. And then we started seeing the walls all lining up. It was, it was just spectacular. OK, so still to come, and um, hopefully if we get the funding and the permissions uh, for this spring, we will run our second season um, at Guavavi. And um, we still need to finish the artifact analysis from the first season of Guavavi. So uh, that'll come first. Um, then the next thing, once we're back out into the field, is to hopefully determine the extent of that pit house village at Guavavi to really extend our understanding of the prehistoric occupation at the mission. Um, hopefully determine the function of that unknown adobe structure. Is it a church? Is it not? Um, what was it used for? If it was a church later, what was it used for? Um, and then to explore that who knows what very large adobe compound structure and, and figure out what that is and, and how old it is. Our preliminary thoughts um, on the, the work that we did was um, we did identify, we were secure that we identified a very large Hoakam 
Pit House Village at Guavavi, which is great because the Park Service can use that for interpretation. That extends the occupation of their site um, into the, the late prehistoric period, which is um, very exciting. And we also are pretty sure we identified a later Yaki mining occupation. So um, we're still running the numbers. My, my RA, my graduate student, is a little bit more skeptical about this than I am. But I think <laughs> that the top layer has a lot more sheep, and that's where most of the slag is, and that's also where we found 18th century English um, ceramics. So that's an eight, or sorry, 19th century English ceramics, so 1800s. So that would be consistent with a, a Yaki occupation. And then underneath that, the slag tends to taper off. There's a few more um, pockets of slag that might be related to some mission um, mining activities. Um, but then it's predominant, predominantly cattle, and that's when we start seeing things like um, Spanish maiolica and uh, Chinese porcelain and, and beads showing up. So I think we've got a Yaki component on top. But um, there's some dispute on that. If Nicole, who's the student right here, were here, she would probably call me out on that. But, you know, that's, that's part of the process. Um, <clears throat> we've also identified some archaic points from Guavavi. So what we know now is we, we knew that there was some archaic component around, but we've been able to extend that occupation firmly from the archaic. There might be an early agriculture component that Homer has also identified, um, a late prehistoric ho hoakam component, and then into uh, the historic period, and then all the way up into the 19th century with the Yaki Miner. So we really um, extended our understanding of the full use and, and occupation of, of Guavavi, um, and the Park Service is, is very excited about that. I think the most exciting thing that came out of it from the Park Service perspective was peach, believe it or not. This was the one thing that got Jeremy to jump up and down in the field when I <laughs> told him, and he literally jumped up and down. We found peach. That was very exciting from an interpretation standpoint. Now they know there was an orchard at the mission. They know there was an orchard. And if you know what they've been doing at Tumacacri, they've reconstructed that orchard. So that fits so well with what they have in terms of their public interpretation. So they were thrilled that we found that peach. OK. So I'm going to put it all together for you. <laughs> um, you know, we've switched from the animal bones to talking about this site in general, and we don't yet have the zooarchaeology for um, Guavavi, so um, we'll get that to you hopefully soon. But what we're seeing is um, the missions, of course, were contributing to a regional economy. They were trading um, with uh, or selling tallow to mining communities, probably other communities in the area. And so we know that they were fully engaged with um, this regional economy, but when we look at the artifacts, it's really telling us the full scope of this interaction and this exchange and showing us that the missions were really embedded within a global economy. So the missions were rendering tallow for sale to the mines. The mines um, are, you know, of course, sending cash back that the missions can use to buy these objects from all over the world, these, these important objects from all over the world. Um, but at the same time, the missions are then contributing to uh, the building of wealth through the mines of the Spanish crown. So the missions are really contributing to the enrichment of the Spanish crown, which is a, a global um, empire at this point. So we can see how these tiny little fragments of bone, you know, buried in the ground in southern Arizona, tell us about the emergence of the modern kind of world economy that we're living in today. This is the beginning of it. You've got China coming from China. <laughs> all the way to southern Arizona. You've got beads coming from Czechoslovakia to southern Arizona. Um, and the, the missions are sort of at the core of this interaction. It's, and more importantly, it's Otam labor that are driving this emergence of this global economy. So it's really important to understand the, the contribution of local um, individuals and local communities to the, the growth and emergence of this global economy. Um, and for me, the most amazing thing is to be able to say that at least in part, because there are lots of other things that are being sold by missions, um, uh, grain being one of them, but at least in part, tallow is one of those commodities. Animal products is one of those commodities that the, the missions are after. So, so for me, this is what gets, this, this is why we do archaeology, is to be able to make those amazing connections between the small scale and the global, and to see these missions not as frontier outposts isolated, but really part of a system, an economic system, um, that extends into the, the system that we're experiencing today. So this is the beginnings of the modern system as, as we're experiencing it today. And we've got that right here in southern Arizona. We can make those connections, even in the 18th century. So that's, um, that's bringing it all together. And that's, that's why I do what I do. That's what gets me jazzed up in, in archaeology. So I have a few acknowledgments to make. Um, <laughs> I wish Homer is here so I could embarrass him a little bit more than I already have. Um, Homer, in addition to being um, one of the top-notch historic archaeologists in North America, um, is also really great with babies. Um, 
which comes in handy when you um, are teaching a field school with your seven-month-old baby in tow. So this is my son, Sagan, uh, being highly entertained by Homer, and specifically his beard. Spent lots of time um, petting Homer's beard. So Homer's really great with kids, too. That, that helped a lot. Um, and I have a lot, lots of other people to th uh, thank as well. Um, desert archaeology, we could not have done this project without desert archaeology. Not only did, um, did Homer work with us, and he was given release, I presume, to be able to work with us. Um, and of course, he put in a lot of his own time, too. Um, we also use uh, the equipment of desert archaeology, which was an epiphany to be able to take a list and just sort of check off what you need. And then you submit it, and a guy brings you all of your equipment, and then you go out in the field. I mean, it was just like the most wonderful thing ever. And to have Mike Brack come down and to do the, the, um, the drone was, was just as spectacular. So um, I look forward to working with you guys again in the future, I hope, <laughs> if you're happy to continue that collaboration. Um, so I especially want to thank Desert Archaeology for the incredible um, support that we got for that project. It could not have happened um, without you guys, um, and tons of other people to thank as well. So um, with that, I will open it up for questions. Anybody has any? Yes. Diane. Uh, awesome pottery. Was there, with the awesome labor, was there anything that was awesome? Um, there was definitely indigenous pottery, but it was plainware. So we can't say too much about it. But there was definitely lots of indigenous pottery, um, tons and tons. But it's all undecorated, which is one of the real sticking issues um, for early colonial period archaeology in the Southwest. The pottery is all plainware. <laughs> Makes it really hard to do anything with dating. But there's tons of it, tons and tons of it. Deer bones. Yes. Did you have fragmentation with the deer bones? Fragmentation? Um, minor. What I saw, so Dale's asking about fragmentation of the deer remains. Um, there are so few deer bones that it would be hard to say, but what I saw was that they're not broken up um, in pieces like this. They're a little bit larger. They're broken. They're not whole, so there might be like marrow extraction, but they're not busted up like this. But we're still doing that analysis. And I remember only a handful of, of deer bones even coming out. So I was just kind of curious from the from the perspective of the awesome who are all of a sudden herding cattle, <laughs> um, perhaps somewhat less hunting. Uh, but the tallow is going, the, the grease is going mainly for tallow as opposed to human consumption. You know, and what kind of uh, feelings they may have had about that. Right. Right. The whole idea of being, it's, it's been put out in the past that cattle was this great contribution to the awesome economy. And, uh, mm -hmm. Maybe not so much. But I, I'm curious as to, to what extent they were using, uh, you know, going after the marrow and the grease from their wild resources prior to uh, the cattle. Right, and this is where it would be really great if we could identify some 17th century Adam context. I mean, there's a few that might be out there, but it's so hard to date these things. It would be really nice if we could identify the, the pre-mission village at Guavavi to be able to um, say something about butchering practices and, and um, use of animals right before the mission period. We can compare it to the Hoakam, but that's, that's tricky um, for many reasons. We want to be careful about giving the impression that Native American culture didn't change at all because it was active and dynamic, just like any culture changed over time. So, um, so it's a yeah, it's a that's an important question. And in the Southeast, it's a heck of a lot easier, um, but we we haven't gotten there in the Southwest yet. So hopefully someday, with some of the work that colleagues are doing, we'll we'll be able to identify some of those those components that'll help us see um, immediate change over time. Um, yeah, we found a couple of cranial fragments. Um, they were pretty uh, friable. They were um, kind of falling apart, but they looked pretty much whole, and so they were probably just dumping the head. Um, it didn't look to me like they were taking the brain out, um, which is something we would expect in the southeast. So, yeah, um, which would be surprising. But that's not to say that they didn't boil the head. They, yeah, they could have done that. Um, there wasn't any 
burning on them, but boiling wouldn't leave burning. And that's an odd thing about tallow rendering is you actually don't see a lot of burning at all because it's in liquid. It's not getting exposed to the, the flames directly. So, so those were not burned, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything. We don't really have a good way of telling whether bone has been boiled or not um, yet. I know there are some, um, some of our former students were working on that problem, but um, unfortunately we can't say yet. That would be the smoking gun, of course, but, or the, the boiled pot. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Uh, earlier in the talk, when you had the uh, the graphs with the uh, uh, comparing the domestic animals and, and uh, uh, the mild and so forth, and you mentioned that uh, there there was pressure to keep the navies on the farm, as it were, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. rather than going out and you know seeing the sights. <laughs> Doing what, what they know how to do. What was the rationale for them? I mean, were they just was it an attempt to <coughs> Europeanize the, the, the folks, the local folks? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the idea of missionization was to recreate. Um, European agrarian communities um, here in the Americas. And um, they wanted them to be good Catholics, good Christians. Um, that meant being there for all of the religious observances all week long. Um, so you'd be there for Sunday mass and Wednesday and every day in which um, religious observances happened. Um, if you're out there um, on the landscape, you can't be watched <clears throat> by the priest. So you might be engaging in activities that are sinful in the eyes of the priest. So. Exactly, exactly. So this was, this was social control, basically. This was a way to keep, um, keep people under the, um, not entire control, because we know that's not possible, but at least under the observation of the priests and the other mission personnel. And also to keep the labor close and to prevent people from running off, um, to prevent fugitivism, basically, right? Um, it was, once you're out there, it's real easy to keep going, um, and then you're losing your labor force, so. Um, well, Dale would be better to talk about the sort of amount of coercion and techniques. Um, there's, what you see is that strategies changed over time. I mean, initially it was about um, gifts and so trying to get people to come in willingly and of course everybody's curious and we all like to have nice things and so you might try, you know, you might start to engage with this new person, um, you know, to get maybe some of the things that you want to um, within your own culture um, show your sort of significance and, and um, power. So there's reasons why you would want to associate um, with this sort of new group. Um, but then over time, I think there were other techniques that developed to try to keep people there. Um, I mean, certainly violence was a part of that. Um, I'm not going to say that it was, um, that that was the only thing that kept people there, but um, certainly violence was, was one aspect of it, of social control at the missions. Um, Dale, do you want to throw anything else out there? I would just say that it was really highly variable. It, it depended much upon the individual circumstances of the missions, the individual temperament of the missionary. Absolutely. Um, also, there's you know how much the uh, native peoples bought into the system, you know, right. and and went along with it. That was really variable. Um, some some really thought that this was a good thing. So there wasn't any, I mean, there was a spillover to a certain extent from the, um, the Pueblo Revolt, right, in the 1690s, wasn't it? The Pueblo and the Revolt. Was that as widespread? I mean, did it affect this area? Do you know? um, that was um, prior to uh, Kino coming through. And so I'm sure it informed his strategy for how he was approaching missionization. That's not an issue that I've explored um, too much, but there was a Pima revolt in 1750, and that, that was huge in this area. And um, a, you know, a few priests were, were killed, not necessarily in southern Arizona, but in other parts of, of the uh, Pimari Alta. Um, so that definitely had a huge impact um, on, on the sort of unfolding of the colonial process. Um, Dale, did you want to? Yeah. It, it could get into a very lengthy. <laughs> 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 there, there was some, there was some effect from the 1680 Pueblo Revolt and, 
I'm actually looking at this much more closely right now. Um, but it, I don't know how much it informed mission strategy per se, but it certainly uh, had an impact on the Spanish colonists yeah. and how they reacted. And there, there was some definite paranoia for a while. Yeah. 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 the horse and mule uh, remains in the bones that we look at. That's a great question. Very little, very little. I don't think we, um, since we're not done with the analysis, I can't say for sure, but I don't remember anything coming out in the midden at all of horse, horse remains. And that's pretty typical for um, the historic sites that I've worked on. There, there's maybe a couple of fragments and that's it. Um, the reason uh, for that is that um, we, we're usually working in sort of domestic context, midden context, and so the horses wouldn't end up being, their bones wouldn't be disposed of there. They might die in the field and not, they wouldn't bring the animal back, <laughs> right? Because it's not being, well, in some cases it's consumed, but for, for the most part not. The other thing is that um, horses are uh, useful not for food, and so they live long lives. And so even though you may have a lot of horses, you may own a lot of horses, it's actually not all that common that they end up in the archaeological record. Um, cattle are, you know, killed when they're between two and four years of age, and so their bones end up in the midden and in the record. But horses, you know, that you might have for 10, 20 years, um, you know, they might die out there on the range, but they're not going to end up in the midden. So, so it's it's weird, um, but it's not surprising once you think about the yeah yeah. Could it also be that because there was uh, human labor, slave labor, that um, they were used of animals for for labor? They had. Um, it's possible that that changed the sort of structure of how they you know sort of balanced human labor and and horse labor. Um, we do know from the historical records that we have some inventories, livestock inventories, and so we know horses were there, um, and so they must have been used for something. And so there's, you know, some stuff that, you know, certainly um, horse labor could be used instead of human labor and vice versa. Um, but there's a lot of it that, you know, like rendering that could not have been done by anything other than somebody with an opposable thumb. <laughs> so, so, yeah. And so it's possible, but it's not something that I've looked at yet is that the full dynamic of labor at the missions and how um, horses, and this is funny that it's coming up um, now because Mary and I are serving on several um, dissertation committees that are looking at horses. So maybe I'll learn enough from the students, again, that are working on these questions to apply to the, the mission period. My sense from the documents is that horses and mules were used more for transportation. Uh, they were also the biggest targets of Apache raiding. Absolutely, yeah. And, but oxen would, be, would have been used more for the field labor. Yeah. You know, and that brings up an, an issue that I didn't get into was that um, we think that there might be some, some flexibility in the ranching strategy so that during times of raiding, they may have um, increased the number of sheep and decreased the number of cattle because cattle are easier to, to raid, to run off. They're easier to steal. Um, cattle, because they're smaller, you can corral them. And we know at San Javier, they were actually they would corral them inside the mission compound. So there must be layers of poop <laughs> in that courtyard at San Javier. Um, so we have some indication, like at Cocospra, um, they had they were subject to quite a bit more raiding than um, San Augustine was, and we see um, far more reliance on sheep at Cocospra. So this is speculation at this point, but one idea is that they were more um, geared towards sheep ranching in response to raiding. So this might be, um, we, we talk about an ecology of fear in natural ecosystems, so this could be related <laughs> uh, process in, in this human ecosystem as well, where they're shifting their strategies based on the amount of raiding that's, that's going on. Was rendering something that came with the Spanish? I know that uh, archaic people here used uh, marrow and all as part of paint, as a binder for paint. So they may have known how to do that, but you have to have iron kettles and things like that in order to... Um, yeah. yeah, that's that's a great question. So the, the knowledge of how to render bone grease would have, you know, is pretty much universal for societies that are still um, connected to the animals that they slaughter. Um, so that sort of technology, that knowledge would have been there, um, but perhaps not on the sort of, I wouldn't say industrial scale, but at least artisanal scale industry um, at the missions. Um, so certainly they would have known how to do that. Um, and I'm not sure what technology would have been used. It could have been pottery. I suppose it could have been baskets or hide as well to do rendering. Um, but probably 
pottery. Um, certainly in the mission period, they would have used metal um, tools for rendering, but the technology was there beforehand. So that would not have been foreign. Perhaps the extent of rendering would have been a, a new thing. Mary's raising her hand. I know she's got something to add. Well, maybe I can just add something to that. Um, the, the, the lard and the tallow is actually something you can get out of bones over and above the other um, oh, thank values. You. Right. There, there are right. three or four grades of fat right. that come from bones, and some of them are highly perishable. You have to eat them right away, mm -hmm. and that includes the, the, the marrow, the marrow, what we call mm -hmm. marrow. And at the other end of the spectrum is uh, tallow and lard-like compounds that uh, are extra work to extract. They're much more difficult to pull out but they preserve much longer. And that's what these guys are, are doing over and above the normal uh, sort of culinary uses of the fats from the bones. And there's, there's, so there's a couple of different places in the body you can get fat. So there's the marrow, there's the bone, the, the grease that's impregnated in the bone. There's also fats that are underneath the skin. Um, and there's also fats that surround the organ. So all of those have slightly different um, qualities that are good for different kinds of uses. Um, so it, um, it's a fascinating read <laughs> if you want to get into the, the industrial tallow uh, literature. So, um, so yeah, that's something that we need to um, parse out too is you know, what these different kinds of tallows you might have been used for in the historic period as well. We know what they're used for today, but um, what, what was their utility in the past? But you know, things like body fat and organ fat, um, we don't have a direct entry into that from the archaeological data. Whereas bone grease, um, that tallow we can actually talk about in terms of these bones were modified to extract it. It's harder to see the modification of the body for cutting out body fat or, or organ fat. Have you found evidence for curing the hides? Have you found chemical caches or anything? No, no. Um, and where we would see it, the first place you would look is on the bones for those cut marks. And they're just, if they're there, they're obliterated. We have a couple that are clearly skinning marks. So um, we have, um, I think it's at St. Augustine, there was a cut mark on a, a jaw, a cattle jaw right here. And that's, that's a pretty typical mark for where you would see skinning. Um, but that very few, not enough to really say, except for circumstantial evidence. We know the, the mines needed them. We know that everybody needed hide. It was a really useful raw material. So we presume that they were skinning them. But we don't have direct archaeological evidence for that. Salary for the next <laughs> revision. <laughs>